Welcome back. In this segment, we define 1D, 2D, 3D, and multidimensional signals. We also distinguish between scalar and vector valued signals. We address the question, is a color image a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional signal? Or what's an example of a, of a four-dimensional signal? We will show representative examples of images with different intensity resolutions. For example, binary images, such as a text image, true color images, when each pixel assumes one of 16 million colors, and pseudo-color images, when we decide on the number of colors to be used for visualization purposes for a color, but also for a black and white image, the pseudo-coloring problem. We also show examples of stereo images emulating human perception. That is, we are able to perceive depth since we use two eyes. If we were to use two cameras at some reasonable distance, the so-called baseline, then the two images or videos recorded by the camera emulate our human visual system. We discuss what the term processing in the title of the course means. The narrow definition of a processing system is one that accepts an image at the input and generates another image at the output. The broader definition, however, the one we adopt in this course, is that of a system which for an image at the input might generate an image at the output, or a decision based on the analysis of the image, which might result in an action, such as to operate, for example, on a patient if the image is a medical image, or the extraction or segmentation of an object from an image based on its color or its motion and maybe even its classification. So let's look at some of these examples in this next segment. Depending on the number of the independent variables, signals can be grouped, classified into one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, or in general, uh, multidimensional. So tone, speech, audio, biomedical are one-dimensional, uh, typically a function of time. If I look at it as a continuous or discrete, I can call it as S of N, so one independent variable. Text and grayscale images are certainly two-dimensional signals where the independent variables represent space. I can have S, X, Y, for example, I can call it. While color, multispectral, hyperspectral images, we'll say a few words about them, have two spatial coordinates and then one can look at the amplitude in two different ways. The one is to say that the amplitude is not a scalar anymore, but a vector, a three by one vector when it comes to color, since I have three different channels, or a seven by one, let's say, for a multispectral image. Or they can be viewed as three dimensional images with two spatial and one spectral coordinates. Video is a 3D signal. It has two spatial and one temporal coordinates, while a 3D volume has three spatial coordinates, X, Y, Z. As an example of a four-dimensional signal, I can look at a volume, an X, Y, Z signal that changes over time, so time is um, the fourth uh, independent variable. Some of the tools that we use to describe signals carry over from 1D to 2D to MD. It's a straightforward extension. One just adds one more variable and everything remains the same in some sense. On the other hand, there are certain results that hold true for one-dimensional signals, but they cannot be generalized for higher dimensional signals. Images and videos are clearly the focus of, of this class, and images are two-dimensional signals, but can be also treated as a three-dimensional where we talk about multispectral, hyperspectral images, while video is a three-dimensional signal, as we already mentioned. So let us look now at some examples, representative examples of, of signals. 
Tones are examples of one-dimensional signals. On top you see a sine wave that only has one frequency present in it at 660 hertz. That's why it's called a pure tone. Let us listen to that. At the bottom you see a square wave. It also has the frequency at 660 hertz. However, it has additional frequencies, the so-called uh, harmonic. Let's listen to that as well. It should be clear that the bottom square wave is richer in the sense of having additional uh, frequencies than the pure tone, uh, the sinusoid. Here we have another example of a one-dimensional signal. It's a piano piece familiar to I assume most of you, and this is a synthesized piece, and we can listen to that as well. Here are some examples of images. On the left you see a binary image, that is I only have two bits to represent the different colors. I have a black and a white value here. Binary images, text images like this one, are used uh, in the fax encoding when we want to transmit such text from point A to point B through a fax machine. In the middle you see, the again, an 8-bit per pixel image, while on the right is a 24-bit per pixel image. This is a true color image. I have two to, to the 24 different color values. This should be around 16 million different colors to represent uh, such an image. There are different ways to represent the color image, one of which is shown here in terms of three different channels, the red, green, and blue channels. This is an RGB decomposition of the image. So each of these channels is a black and white image, I use um, 8 bits to represent it, so each of the channels has two, 256 different values, and 8 bits per channel times 3, therefore 24 bits to represent the color image. So if we look at this image, the nose of the madrill here is quite red, and therefore we see that uh, the pixel values in the red channel are quite high. Uh, white is represented by high values close to 256 well it's 0 to 255 so close to 55 while the darker values are closer to 0 so the red nose has high values in the red channel and pretty small values in the other two channels on the other hand if I look at the cheeks of the madrill this is a variation of blue not exactly the blue color so I see high values in the red, I'm sorry, in the blue channel and relatively smaller values, well, definitely smaller in the red and semi somewhere in the middle in uh, the green channel, right? Actually, this particular value apparently is a combination of uh, green and blue. The Landsat program is responsible for the acquisition of satellite imagery of, of the Earth. It started in 1972 and the most recent satellite, Landsat 8, was launched in this year. Landsat 7 data has eight spectral bands with spatial resolutions ranging from 15 to 60 meters, and the temporal resolution is 16 days. The main instrument on board Landsat 7 is the Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus, ETM Plus. The resolution is 30 meters except band 6 that has 60 meter resolution and band 8 that has 15 meter resolution. Band 8 by the way is the panchromatic band so you have um, low or high rather uh, spatial resolution 15 meters while you have low spectral resolution. By the way this is the visible range of light here. So this is the blue, green, red channel, while the rest are infrared. 
Landsat data have helped to improve our understanding of Earth, and due to Landsat today, we have a better understanding of things as diverse as coral reefs, tropical deforestation, and Antarctica's glaciers. So here's an example of a Landsat 7 image of the city of Amsterdam. Uh, up here you see the blue, green, and red channels, and the rest of the channels, the four other channels, are infrared. By the way, hyperspectral images uh, are the ones that uh, have many more bands, up to 200, even 300 bands, but uh, the main characteristic are the that the bands are much closer uh, spaced uh, as compared to the multispectral images. Very often, uh, in order to be able to appreciate the Landsat uh, images, uh, the visible bands are combined. This is what you see on the left image. This is, by the way, a Landsat image of the city of London. So these uh, natural-looking images are familiar to human eyes. So the reservoirs here, close to Heathrow, are uh, shown in dark blue, while the city itself is um, shown in gray. So these uh, images um, offer very good views of city infrastructure, sediment, and also uh, bathymetry. We can tell how, how deep the, the water is uh, over there. Uh, however, a band one three image, it, it, it's not useful, it's difficult to distinguish between different types of vegetation and between clouds and snow. So therefore, in the middle image, um, we combine the three channels, channel four, two, and three, in other words, one infrared band and the green and blue channels. This is a widely used combination that's especially useful for studies of vegetation since the different types of plants reflect infrared light in different ways. Now, another combination is the 742 shown on the right, so two infrared bands plus green. And this combination is especially useful for geological and agricultural studies because band 7 can help discriminate between various types of rocks and mineral. And bright green here uh, indicates vege vegetation, while the water appears dark blue or black. Now our natural world is three-dimensional, while the images are two-dimensional. They present the projection of a 3D world onto the 2D plane. In order to perceive depth, we need two eyes, uh, so we need two cameras that will capture the same scene and therefore they will emulate the uh, human visual system. So here you see on the left what the left camera sees and on the right what the right camera sees. And the difference between these two images is a so-called disparity map. It tells us how each and every pixel moved from one image in going from one image to the next or if i use the disparity map i can map the left image onto the right image the disparity map relates to the depth in in the image so the two channels if fused appropriately will give us the depth perception and the fusion could be done through um, a red and blue channel and therefore i can use uh, um, color-coded um, glasses, or I can use uh, glasses with different polarization and so on. Here is a, another example of a stereo image. In this case, this is a, a Landsat image. Actually, two Landsat images were used that uh, were acquired of the same scene that were acquired uh, one year apart. So the satellite does not go exactly over the same position necessarily, and the two images uh, represent two different images from the left and right channel of the same scene, and therefore they can be combined to give us uh, the depth perception. You can obtain depth information also using the Kinect camera. It projects a known pattern onto the scene and infers depth from the deformation of the pattern. So the Kinect combines structured light with two computer vision techniques, uh, depth from focus and depth from stereo. The Kinect is intended to use 
with um, the Xbox and uh, therefore it's of interest there to compute the depth map but also infer the body position. Um, so you see here the skeleton of the person on, on the left image, right? So here's the person, this is the depth map and also the Kinect provides a, a visible image shown here. So you see the visible and the corresponding depth image that shows where the person stands and where the door is and so on. We can see here a, a short video that shows both the visible image as well as the depth image um, acquired by the Kinect camera. Very often we are interested in capturing the three-dimensional structure of an object. So instead of using two cameras, as in the stereo case, we use many cameras on a specific rig. So as you can see here, the image of this particular object is viewed from many different um, angles. Here's an example of a video. A video consists of individual frames. And one could argue that um, a video is nothing else than a collection of images. And therefore, if I have an algorithm that is effective in processing an image, a still frame, as it's called, also I could apply the same algorithm to frame after frame and um, I will be done. However, what is special about video is that these frames are highly correlated and therefore I can um, gain if in processing such frames I take this correlation into account. Of course these frames, if they're displayed at some frame rate, 30 frames per second for example, one can perceive the actual motion in the scene. Finally, processing in the title of the course means the manipulation of the values of an image or a video by a computer so as the resulting image is more useful to us or has some desirable properties. For example, uh, the result of processing might be the removal of blur, as is the case here. You, you see the input to the system is an aerial photograph that is blurred due to motion between the camera and the scene and at the output is a sharper, a restored image. Uh, now, if an image is input, an image is output, this has been the kind of narrow definition of processing, also referred to as filtering, and the broader meaning of processing that we adopt here is that um, an image or a video can be input to a system, and we're interested in extracting important features from such an image, or we're interested in making decisions based on the image. Uh, as the example here shows, this is a, a chest X-ray at the input, and based on the analysis that will be performed, uh, whether there is a malignant tumor or not, for example, certain decisions and actions will be the output of the system. As time goes on, what we see is that the boundaries between traditionally separate areas become fuzzy, or in other words, there is overlap between these traditionally separate areas. So when it comes to signal processing, and more specifically to image and video processing that we'll be dealing with in this class, there is overlap between the, this field and the fields of communication, computer vision, machine learning, and optimization. 